Step 3. Boundary Conditions 1. Now we are getting to the main two steps of this lesson. So, now we are going to start to the, derive the expressions for the boundary conditions between the two electrics. In particular, we want to know exactly what happens to the electric field component and the magnetic field component of light radiation as it travels from one dielectric into a different one. So here are our two dielectrics, dielectric 1 at the top and dielectric 2 at the bottom. In dielectric 1, we've got uh, our coefficients Ke1, Km1, and dielectric 2, Ke2, Km2. And we've got our um, electric field uh, components of our light radiation in dielectric 1. Here, this uh, arrow, this vector, basically means uh, how the wave is polarized. And we are assuming that in dielectric 1, it's got components um, in the vertical and horizontal um, direction and that are different from the components in the vertical and horizontal directions of the electric field in dielectric 2. And the purpose of this lesson, and the purpose of these two steps, is to derive relationships between EV1, EV2, EH1, EH2, and so on. So, how do we do it? With our good old friends, the Maxwell's equations. Here they are in the form written uh, for a dielectric with some coefficients Ke and Km. But otherwise, they are the same as before with the same meaning. There are four equations, therefore we will obtain four boundary conditions. They will be the vertical and horizontal components for the electric field and the magnetic field in dielectric 1 and in dielectric 2. So we are looking for precise relationships between E, V1, EV2, between EH1, EH2, and the same for the magnetic field components. In this step, we will go slowly uh, through the first boundary condition, and we will start with Maxwell's first equation. So let's see how it works. There's a little trick that I'm going to tell, tell you about. Always when we are considering the flux, either electric flux or a magnetic flux through a surface, we always consider a cylindrical surface. It's basically because it really simplifies a lot of these equations. If you want, you could consider a more general type of surface, but the equations would be a lot nastier and more difficult to handle, and in the end, the result would be the same um, as the uh, cylindrical surface. So, this is our equation M1, Maxwell's first equation, and we have rewritten it uh, um, by multiplying both sides by Ke times epsilon naught. Now we will see uh, how things simplify in the case of a dielectric. This sum on the right-hand side over all the charges is simply zero. Remember, we said a few steps back that in dielectrics there are no free charges. Therefore, the total uh, uh, f um, flux of the electric field through this cylindrical surface multiplied by Ke uh, times epsilon naught is zero. So, let's compute the flux. We are going to consider the flux through the top surface first and the bottom surface. You notice that EH1 is parallel to the surface, meaning it is perpendicular to the vector dA for this surface, because the dA is pointing up like this. Therefore, the only contributions to the top and the bottom of the cylindrical surface are going to come from EV1 and EV2. Similarly, if we consider now the side of the cylinder, now we can see that EV1 is uh, parallel to the side of the cylinder, meaning it's perpendicular to dA, therefore it will not contribute to our flux through that side of the cylinder. The only contributions will come from EH1 and EH2. So, let's just sub-plug it in and see what we get. Rewriting the left-hand side of Maxwell's first equation, we get the following. Ke1. We have to add index 1 
because we are in dielectric one. Ke1 times epsilon naught times Ev1 times the area A, that's the flux going through this top flat surface of the cylinder, minus Ke2. Why is it minus? Because now we have we are considering the bottom of the cylinder, meaning the vector dA is pointing in the opposite direction, we're resulting in this minus in here. Minus Ke2 times epsilon naught times Ev2 times A, and then we have to add the contributions through the sides, coming from EH1 and EH2, which simply I will just describe as some term gamma. And this whole sum has to be equal to zero. Now, why did I not explicitly write down the contributions from uh, EH1 and EH2 going through the sides of the cylinder? Simply because we can alter the shape of the cylinder and get rid of gamma. How do we do it? Simply, we shrink the height of the cylinder. If we are shrinking the height of the cylinder, in other words, we take the limit of L going to zero, there will be no flux going through the sides. All we are left, the only surface, is a flat pancake, a flat circle sitting um, on, on the interface between dielectric 1 and dielectric 2. So we will get that this first term minus the second term has to be equal to 0. We can simplify further. We can divide by A, we can divide by epsilon naught, and what we get is our first boundary condition. We get that Ke1 times Ev1 must be equal to Ke2 times Ev2. In the next step, we will derive the second boundary condition coming from Maxwell's third equation. So, see you there.